Boldwood presents Cold-Blooded Murder, Shocking True Stories of Killers and Psychopaths. Written by Brad Hunter and read by Robert G. Slade. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Introduction Murder is the vilest crime known to man. It is often triggered through love or money or sex. Those are the three big ticket items when it comes to homicide. But people are strange. They will kill for the most obscure and ridiculous of reasons. In 30 years covering murder in New York and Canada as a journalist, I have discovered every case has a distinctive flavor. The evil lurking within a seemingly ordinary man or woman stuns cops and friends alike. In this collection of some of the most memorable cases I've covered, you will meet serial killers, rich kid monsters, football stars and wives in pursuit of hormone-charged hijinks. The very rich and the very poor, successful lawyers and hotel executives, Southern bells who could melt butter with a come-hither wink and a sexy drawl. Daddy's girls, who have gleaming smiles and good grades, but are possessed by the devil. These are stories of all American crimes, and they stretch from coast to coast. You will find serial killers, cheating husbands and wives so desperate for love that they'll kill for it. Some of these crimes are well known like the dating game killer, responsible for up to a hundred murders. He was a man so sinister that even though he's now rotting on death row, detectives are still trying to connect the dots of his murderous rampage, forty years after his last kill. Others are not as well known. There's the AIDS researcher, who was slowly poisoned by arsenic and died in agony. The prize for his cheating wife was a new man, a new life, and lots of money. Ultimately, these are the stories of humans, fatal and flawed, who for reasons often known only to themselves, decided to solve their problems with murder. In the course of my career, I have also covered several mafia assassinations in New York City and Toronto. The difference between the professional hitmen and the killers in this collection is that when the mob kills, it's never personal. It's strictly business. With the murderers in this collection, it's always personal. Chapter 1. Arsenic at the Bowling Alley On the 15th of November, 2000, Eric Miller came home after a night of beer and bowling with the boys. He was pale as a sheet, and he wasn't feeling well, which had been a common complaint of his lately. His concerned wife, Anne, told him to go to bed. Maybe it was something he had eaten. Two weeks later, 30-year-old Eric was dead. Raleigh, North Carolina, was at one time a sleepy southern university and government town known as the City of Oaks for its stunning trees. Its Grecian architecture had largely escaped the ravages of the bloody U.S. Civil War, most of the action bypassing the then, as now, state capital. Following the Second World War, the far-sighted municipal leadership turned the city into one of the fastest-growing and most livable cities in the U.S. It was a veritable economic dynamo. Driving the growth, besides the multiple universities in the area, was the Research Triangle Park, established in 1959. The aim of creating this area was to develop the employment of the future for the sleepy South, as it shed its rural yoke and racist past. Tens of thousands of high-paying, high-tech jobs were created in science, technology, and healthcare. New people brought new ideas and new money to the area, and the population exploded to total more than a million residents. 
That kind of possibility and opportunity was what brought Eric and Ann Miller to the area. The Brainy Millers met in a biology class at Indiana's Purdue University in the early 1990s. Eric was an Indiana boy and grew up not very far from the school they would both attend. I really think she's the one, Eric reportedly told his family of the blonde beauty. She's everything I dreamed my wife would be. Ann Miller was born in Batavia, New York, near Buffalo, in 1970, and had graduated from high school in Pennsylvania. On Valentine's Day 1991, Eric proposed to her. The head-over-heels-in-love young couple were married at St. Elizabeth Catholic Church in Cambridge, Indiana, before moving to Raleigh in 1993. They were both accepted into graduate programs at North Carolina State University. Eric was a postdoctoral fellow at UNC Chapel Hill's Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, while Anne worked at GlaxoSmithKline in the Research Triangle Park. They were always holding hands and happy. They came in the morning together, they left together. You know, they just seemed to be the perfect couple, said their friend Bernie Brown. Anne was, I think, the more dominant of the two in the relationship. She liked to call the shots. Things were going swimmingly for the young couple. By 2000, they owned their own home in an expensive part of the city, two cars, and even a boat. That same year, they also welcomed a baby girl, Claire, as the couple became a family. The Millers would also organize retreats for engaged couples at their church. Eric eventually earned a prestigious fellowship as a pediatric AIDS researcher, and Anne accepted a high-ranking position at a powerful pharmaceutical company. Eric told his friends, Life doesn't get better than this. I have everything a man could possibly want. But before the year was out, he was dead, and the Miller's seemingly perfect life lay in tatters. What or who killed Eric Miller? How could a devoted husband and father end up being killed by a bizarre mystery ailment? And, still only thirty, was shattered. She spent her time crying, and her friends and family did their best to support her. She was the epitome of the tragic widow and nothing she did raised suspicions. However, detectives began suspecting that something was amiss behind what they believed was nothing more than the facade of the ideal marriage. Anne's story was not holding up well to their probings, cynical though the cops might have been. The night Eric became ill for the final time had been far from a one-off. His death in hospital marked the culmination of weeks of flu-like symptoms that doctors had been unable to figure out. Anne had already rushed him to the hospital once before. That time, he recovered and was sent home a few days later. This was before the final bout in the hours after his weekly bowling league, this one marked by particularly violent illness. When, days later, he died, his last moments on earth had been marked by agonizing pain. The doctors at last dropped a bombshell on his parents, Verus and Doris, who were already grieving. Adding to their misery was something they would not have suspected in their wildest dreams. His blood was laced with arsenic, the doctor solemnly told them. The diagnosis matched the symptoms. Death by arsenic poisoning is one of the most horrific ways there is to die. It usually starts with headaches and confusion, followed by severe diarrhea, then drowsiness. Acute poisoning leads to vomiting, then vomiting blood, blood in the urine, cramping muscles, hair loss, horrific stomach pains, and convulsions. Eventually, organs shut down and death soon follows. For Eric's bewildered parents, none of this made any sense, and they were too grief-stricken at that moment to try and make sense of it. At Eric's funeral, bravely holding little Claire, Anne was inconsolable. Why? Why did Eric have to die? Why did he have to die? She wailed as friends and family tried to comfort her. Back in Raleigh, 
detectives weren't quite ready to give Anne a pass for her performance. Typically, in these kinds of cases, investigations begin at home and branch out. Anne had the opportunity, but did she have a motive? No one was calling the death of the young scientist murder. Not yet, anyhow. No, that decision hadn't been made, but there were still a lot of I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed. Arsenic poisoning was not just a plot twist in an Agatha Christie novel. The police began to carry out a routine search of the couple's home and workplaces, and the evidence started to conflict with Anne's heartbroken wails. Raleigh Police's Detective Lieutenant Chris Morgan began to believe he was looking at a homicide. Still, the finger of suspicion did not point at Anne. Initially, cops turned to her for help. Maybe she could shed light on Eric's professional life. Did he have a jealous rival, or was there another woman or man involved? Who would want the beloved AIDS researcher dead? When that avenue proved to go nowhere, Morgan and his team began thinking the unthinkable. Could it be Anne? Her laboratory job gave Anne access to arsenic. But why would she turn on the man of her dreams? Maybe it was Anne who was hiding something and not her dearly departed husband. First on the cop's to-do list was the matter of Daryl Willard, a biochemist at Anne's lab. He had been at the bowling alley on the 15th of November and ordered a pitcher of beer, pouring his pal Eric Miller a glass of the brew. This beer tastes kind of funky. Something's wrong with it, friends remembered Eric saying. An hour later, he was in the emergency room. While Willard, 37, avoided the police, colleagues mentioned how he had been infatuated, maybe even in love, with Anne. It was never clear how and when the relationship began shifting from flirtation to sexual passion and then reached the point of no return. But investigators also learned that Anne had a third man on the go. He was a California scientist she had been involved with since 1997 just four years after she and Eric were married. The week before Eric's death, Willard and Anne enjoyed a sex-packed weekend in the Windy City. The pair traveled to Chicago on the 10th of November. At the posh Ritz-Carlton, the lovers were registered as Mr. and Mrs. Daryl Willard and ordered room service several times over the next two days. Anne had told Eric that the trip was for her work. For his part, Willard told his oblivious wife that he was having a get-together with old university friends. Just three days after the pair returned to Raleigh, Eric Miller and Willard had their fateful bowling night with several of Willard's co-workers. Now the cops were beginning to see a possible motive for murder. Investigators conducted interviews and studied email messages and phone records, along with forensic evidence. From these sources, they learned how Ann Miller, along with Daryl Willard, her co-worker and lover, had conspired to poison Eric with arsenic. At first, like the other characters in the developing melodrama, Willard hadn't seemed to fit the mold of a killer. He was a devoted husband, stand-up father, and respected scientist. He hardly seemed the type to be a player in this unfolding soap opera. Yet his phone records told quite another story. Throughout that fateful autumn, Willard and Ann Miller rang each other a whopping 110 times, often stealing phone calls as late as 4.30 a.m. Most damningly, they spoke for a full 24 minutes just two hours before Eric died. That same night, an email to Willard retrieved from Ann's computer sealed the deal. I never want to stop making you feel, she wrote. I want to show you new things. I want to touch places in you that you knew not existed. Morgan, the suspicious Southern detective, said later that when he read that, he thought to himself of Willard, he's our guy. While the pressure was mounting on Willard, and he knew it, new evidence was revealing yet more inconsistencies with Anne's own story. In the hours before Eric's death, 
as he suffered terribly from the horrific mystery ailment that was slowly killing him, Anne had abruptly left his bedside to clean the house. Her actions were curious, to say the least. She began throwing away items, everything from bathroom rugs to Eric's clothes. It didn't make sense. Eric's sister, Leanne, witnessed her sister-in-law's actions and acknowledged they were odd. But she also knew that everyone reacts differently to stress, and maybe, she told herself, this was Anne's way. But she also recalled an occasion several weeks earlier, when Eric's visiting parents had given the couple some alone time. Anne and Eric shared a romantic chicken dinner, and as the police discovered later that night, Eric visited the hospital for what would be the second to last time. As the noose began tightening in the months after Eric's murder, Anne abruptly stopped cooperating with the police. She had also hired the most high-profile, experienced lawyers that money could buy. These were not the actions of an innocent person, and Morgan's suspicions grew. Her deceased husband's family, though, were more forgiving and proved to be a big help as the young widow began the struggle to rebuild her life. They would soon find out things that would obliterate their image of their grieving daughter-in-law. The whole family gathered for Claire's first birthday on the 21st of January, 2001. Her father had been dead just two months, and the clan were bravely determined to soldier on. But there were unexpected guests at the party. Detective Deborah Regenton and a team of other investigators. When Anne saw the police, she ran upstairs and hid in a closet. While Anne wept, Regenton told the family about her affair with Willard. Meanwhile, nine miles down the road, Morgan was knocking on Daryl Willard's door. The veteran detective was blunt when he confronted the scientist. He got straight to the point. Daryl, I think you've been used by a woman, Morgan told the shaking but not surprised man. Willard sadly replied, Yeah, and she's done a very good job of it. Morgan was certain that Daryl was the key to unlocking this mystery. He could put Anne center stage in the sickening murder plot, and from there, on death row. But just 24 hours later, the game completely changed, and justice for Eric Wilson slipped further from the grasp of police. Yvette Willard found her husband's lifeless body in the garage. Believing it would be he who would be the principal suspect in the case, Willard had shot himself in the head and left a note. In it he told her and the world, I have been accused of an action for which I am not responsible. I have taken no one's life save my own. His heartbroken wife, Yvette, would agree that, yes, in hindsight, she had to admit she'd had some suspicions about her husband's odd behavior, but she had never confronted him. In her heart, she knew, though, as most women do, that she was being betrayed. If I say these words, I won't be able to get them back, she explained to police justifying the fact that she didn't want to acknowledge what had been going on at first. Following Eric's murder, her husband had mustered the courage to sit his wife down. I don't know if I love you anymore, she recalled him telling her. There's someone else. Yvette asked, Ann Miller? He replied, yes. It was a love that he felt had destroyed his prospects if his suicide note was any indication. He was the second man to receive the Merry Widow's bite. The world looks black to me, he went on in the letter to his loved ones, justifying the dramatic action he was about to take. All I can see is the smearing of my name, pain caused to my family, personal humiliation, and probably economic ruin. Practically speaking, in terms of investigating the case, this was not only a tragedy, but a problem for cops wanting to get the grips with the murder. Daryl Willard could have put it all together. The district attorney could have offered him a deal to get to Ann Miller. Morgan was now worried his case was shot, 
and, as Daryl Willard had feared, his name was now being dragged through the mud. He was being portrayed as the lovesick killer who would do anything to be with Anne. That was the narrative that Anne fed her in-laws. She wove stories about Daryl's desperate obsession with her. She accused him of poisoning Eric to get her beloved husband out of the picture so they could be together. Eric's family swallowed her tales hook, line, and sinker, and Daryl Willard's name was besmirched from one end of North Carolina to the other. Then the full autopsy report was released. Eric had been dosed with arsenic while he was in the hospital. He received the fatal measure while at home recovering. And there were traces of the poison in his hair from months earlier, before Anne's affair with Willard had started. Willard had been in on the plot, but only for the final two weeks before Eric died. In the end, there was only one suspect left, Anne. Morgan was desperate to put her behind bars, considering her evil incarnate. For her part, Anne did little to avert the detective's suspicions. She had insurance money and was swift in moving on with her life. Within months of Eric's death, she reinvented herself. She packed up and left Raleigh, got a job with an interior designer, and moved 120 miles away to Wilmington, North Carolina and the ultimate betrayal so soon after her husband's tragic death and lover's suicide? She had a new man. The optics sucked. None of this necessarily made her a killer, but it was also hardly the behavior of a grieving widow or a suspect in a high-profile murder investigation. Morgan thought a lot about Ann Miller in those days after she left town for greener pastures. He later recalled wondering to himself what kind of person watches her husband die and doesn't look back. Even as Anne began constructing the facade of her new life, new troubling information about her was surfacing daily. Police retrieved more emails about the third man she had been involved with in California. Here was another unpalatable fact. Anne's husband was dying in the hospital and the soon-to-be widow was playing the odds of who was going to be the best bet, Daryl Willard or the man in California. She was casting her net for a new life. Anne's odd behavior encompassed destroying evidence, insisting on time alone with Eric, and demanding his cremation, and it finally added up to make a sinister plot. Cold, calculated, and inhumane. Morgan waited for an order to arrest Anne, but it was an order that never came. With the evidence being mostly circumstantial, the case reached a legal stalemate. It seemed to be going nowhere. More than a year had passed since Eric Wilson was murdered. Willard was dead, and Anne was free as a bird. Morgan read and reread the files, hoping for a lucky break, a snippet, a voice from the dead. In February 2002, he got that break. Buried in the transcript of Yvette Willard's police interview was a comment that her husband's attorney, Rick Gammon, warned Daryl that he could be charged with attempted murder for his alleged involvement in the demise of Eric Wilson. Willard must have told Gammon something, Morgan recalled thinking. This is going to be the key to this case but Gammon stonewalled Morgan. No way, he said, citing client lawyer privilege. The legal eagle was keeping his own counsel. As for Anne, none of the drama in Raleigh was affecting her one iota. She had well and truly moved on by the third anniversary of Eric's death. Just before that date, she wed Christian rocker Paul Kantz, having met him at a concert in Wilmington. If he was bothered by his new bride's blemished past, he wasn't showing it. Another year passed. Morgan, nearing retirement, grew frustrated. He wanted to end his career having put a vile killer behind bars. That vile killer was Ann Miller. Then he received an unexpected opening, the break he'd been waiting for. 
In the spring of 2004, the North Carolina Supreme Court suddenly ordered Gammon to reveal the conversations he had with Daryl Willard. Gammon told the court that Anne had admitted to Daryl that she had tampered with Eric's intravenous tube while he was facing death in the hospital. She said she was going to finish the job. Morgan had been right all along. Daryl Willard was the key to the case. Now prosecutors could place the arsenic in Anne's hands. Four years later, Ann Miller reached the end of the line. She was ordered to surrender and was charged with Eric's murder on the 27th of September, 2004. But cops and prosecutors knew their case was fragile. She could walk, or equally, they could put her in the electric chair. Fearing a legal technicality could hurt their chances, the prosecution reluctantly offered a plea deal to Anne. Twenty-five years in prison. And she took it. On the 8th of November, 2005, the horrific details of the ghastly crime were read in court, and now Anne Miller Kantz faced Eric's family. Yet even at the moment of truth, Anne couldn't help pointing the finger at her boyfriend Daryl Willard, once more deflecting blame. Not once did she look Eric's family in the face. Her lawyer read her statement to the court. No motive was offered for her fiendish machinations. For reasons I do not now understand, I permitted myself to knowingly participate with Daryl Willard in events which cost my husband his life, she wrote. I will struggle for the rest of my life with how this could have happened. I have asked God to forgive me, and I hope that God will also help those others whom I have hurt to find it in their hearts one day to forgive me as well. Yet the only thing that remained for the family of Eric Miller, a bright, devoted family man, was bitterness and hatred towards the woman they had warmly welcomed into their lives. At Anne's sentencing, Eric's sister Leanne confronted her, overflowing with raw emotion. I don't believe that you, Anne, truly love your daughter. How could you when you have taken away one of the most precious gifts that she will ever have? Her father. I will never understand, Anne, why you just didn't divorce him, Leanne said. After being pummeled by victim impact statements, Anne Miller Kantz turned around to face her rock guitarist husband and smiled. A judge had ruled Anne Miller would not be able to have contact with her daughter, who is now age 20. Claire had been raised by Anne's sister, Danielle Wilson and Eric's family in a shared custody arrangement. After the sentencing, Chris Morgan retired from the police force, vindicated but with a bitter taste in his mouth. He went past his retirement date just to see Ann Miller behind bars. I mean, it's one thing if your son or your daughter or whoever is murdered by a stranger, but we know and we've said from the beginning a stranger couldn't have done this, Morgan said. Most people don't get served food, and that's what you give people arsenic with, by strangers. Two good men are dead. Two little girls will never know their fathers. Ann Miller is a psychopath. She never felt any guilt. She never felt any remorse. Postscript. Ann Miller signed a plea deal with the prosecutors who put her in prison. That meant she could not appeal her 25-year sentence. Now 51, she remains incarcerated at the Anson Correctional Institution about two hours from Raleigh. She is projected to be released on the 15th of September, 2029. Chapter 2. Angel-Faced Monster Alba, Texas is the kind of town where neighbors stop to chat and leave their doors unlocked. The community, which sits about 60 miles northeast of Dallas, may have once enjoyed glories in its past, but they have long since ebbed. Founded as a speck on the map in the 1880s, its population peaked around 1911. Its coal mining boom went bust, not least because the mines relied on convict labor. 
It was one of those places in the U.S. South that was known as a sundown town, forbidding blacks and Hispanics from living or working in the area. Sundown town encompassed a range of laws and intimidation, but originally came from signs that literally instructed non-whites to leave town before the day was out. Even today, Alba remains a 99% white outpost of an increasingly multicultural state. With a gas station, grocery store, a diner, and not a lot else, Alba was content to live in the quiet of the past. But that peaceful illusion was about to be shattered. In the early morning hours of the 1st of March 2008, the 492 residents of Alba woke up to a horror show. That morning, three members of the much-loved Caffey family were discovered murdered, their cozy country home a smoldering ruin. It had been a slaughter. It seemed that nobody could survive that kind of inferno, yet within an hour, a police officer discovered a trembling Aaron Caffey, 16, naked in a trailer home a few miles away, burrowed under a pile of clothes and stuffed animals. Where am I? she asked childishly, her blue eyes wide with fright. It was a miracle. Her father, Terry, had already been discovered near death and was now fighting for his life in a local hospital. And it didn't take long for detectives to discover that something sinister was roiling under this facade of a seemingly perfect family now utterly destroyed. In the three years since the Caffeys had moved to Alba, they had established themselves as pillars of the community. Terry, 41, was a devoted churchgoer at the Miracle Faith Baptist Church. He had even preached a few sermons himself while working toward being ordained. He was a private carer by profession, but his faith was his true passion and calling. His wife, Penny, 37, worked for Meals on Wheels, played piano at the church, and homeschooled their kids. Their three children, slight, pretty, blonde-haired Aaron, and her awe-inspiring singing voice, 13-year-old Matthew and 8-year-old Tyler, were youth group regulars. The Caffeys had no problem fitting into the 50s throwback community of Alba. I know there's no such thing as perfect, but in my book they were, said Tommy Gaston, a neighbor of the family. The children were all well-behaved, but Terry and Penny seemed especially protective of Aaron, who worked at the local Sonic Drive-In as a car hop, the job title given to waiting staff working with driving customers. Her parents' grip only tightened when she started dating 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson. She gushed innocence, a Sonic co-worker told Texas Monthly. A lot of guys flirted with her, and she would just blush and smile and duck her head down and skate inside and tell me, that guy wanted my number. And I'd say, did you tell him that your mom would be answering the phone? A colleague said that Erin seemed sheltered and often stunned at the world around her, outside the warm bosom of her family. If Erin appeared innocent and unworldly, her strict parents had made her that way, homeschooling their brood to keep them away from what they believed was the wickedness of the secular world. They had taken their kids out of mainstream education when Erin was just thirteen. Another girl had shown a romantic interest in her and had kissed her in the hall of the local school. Bad enough if a stolen kiss had been taken by a boy, but by a girl. This was all too much for the couple, and they tightened the screws on their only daughter. The Caffey children were forced to follow a strict Bible-based curriculum, although they still seemed, to everyone who knew them, happy and well-adjusted. To say that church, faith, and family formed the central focus of Caffey family life would be an understatement. Terry and Penny had met in their early twenties at a revival meeting through the Baptist church, and their week still revolved around religious activity. Sunday was reserved for church services at the Miracle Faith Baptist Church. 
Wednesday was Bible study night, and the rest of the time they would play their favorite gospel songs at home. Penny on piano, Brother Matthew on guitar, and Aaron singing. The family was not shy about broadcasting their faith. Above their driveway, a wooden sign declared, The Caffies, Joshua 2415. The verse served to remind Terry every day of their righteousness. If it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Erin turned 16 in July 2007. Her parents allowed her to get her driver's license and that job at the local Sonic. With her wages, she purchased an old pickup truck. Yet even under the watchful eyes of her parents and the church community, she was starting to discover boys. For her religious parents, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Following one church meeting, Erin was spotted by a youth minister kissing a teen boy. That wasn't the first time she had been seen in a romantic clinch. Kids had also spotted her kissing another boy, he with his hand up her skirt. This was common behavior for most teens, but a treacherous walk on the wild side for Erin. Her parents were mortified when they were informed about her hormone-charged hijinks and told Erin she was not to see the boy again. And then... Charlie Wilkinson arrived on the scene. They met at the Sonic when he returned from a summer with the Texas National Guard. Early on, I had reservations about the young man. There were just things about him that didn't sit right with me, Terry later said. Charlie had grown up in the area with a large family. Like a lot of young rural Texans, he spent his youth hunting and fishing. He and Aaron quickly became infatuated spending nearly every day together. He called it a vibe the two of them shared. He was totally in love with her and considered her his soulmate, Charlie's pal Dion Kip Jr. later said. Charlie talked about Aaron 24-7. The pastor at Miracle Faith, unlike Terry, believed that Charlie seemed like a nice boy after he started attending the church. Wilkinson became a fixture at the Caffey's home despite Terry's reservations. Terry thought Charlie was disrespectful at their very first meeting when he found the teen sprawled out on his favorite chair. As the Caffey's golden girl became ever more rebellious, the family blamed Charlie. Whether that was fair or not, they wanted the boy out of her life. Two months into their relationship, the teen couple started having sex, and having it frequently, too. It was all very new and thrilling for Aaron, and like any other teen boy, Charlie was also enthralled by the first sting of lust. Tensions at home only escalated as the relationship developed. The religious family were shocked at the dramatic changes in their daughter. You can only see him once a week, they declared at one point. Parental interference in young love traditionally has the opposite effect. And so it proved in the case of Aaron and Charlie. It only cemented the bond between the teen lovebirds and ignited Aaron's smoldering sense of rebellion. She yearned to run away and live her life free of the influence of her overbearing parents. Secretly, in the deepest, darkest recesses of her heart, she was considering more drastic solutions. In early February, the situation reached its tragic breaking point. Penny discovered that Aaron had snuck her mobile into her room to talk to Wilkinson past curfew. That's it, Penny reportedly said. Give me your mobile and your car keys. You're grounded. He's not welcome in my house anymore. The fading angel in Aaron began slipping into a black vortex. The demons stepped forward and made their presence known. Erin was becoming convinced that homicide, murdering her own parents, was the only way she could be with her Charlie. Erin began plotting. She wanted them out of her life. Are you sure you want to do this? Charlie asked. Using all the sexual power she had recently discovered, Erin issued a harsh ultimatum. 
If you love me, you'll do it. Wilkinson reluctantly began gathering weapons. He recruited his friend, 20-year-old Charles Allen Wade, and Wade's 18-year-old girlfriend, Bobby Gale Johnson. On the 27th of February, 2008, the fuse of this hormonal dynamite was lit when Penny stumbled upon Charlie's MySpace page and was appalled to read comments he made about sex and drinking. The Caffeys had certainly not raised their daughter to be with someone like that. When Erin returned from school, her steaming parents were waiting to confront her about the situation. It's over, Terry said, issuing the edict. You're breaking up with him today. The girl seemed to give in easily, perhaps too easily. The Caffeys did not, could not, know that just behind the corner, death was lying in wait. A little after midnight, two days later, Erin was waiting for her three accomplices. But there was a problem. The twisted trio were scared off by the Caffey's barking dog. They drove off. Erin was not a happy young girl. She rang Charlie thirteen times in two hours, luring him back and promising to keep the dog quiet. The teens returned, picked up Erin, and drove around for an hour finalizing their plot. Charlie and Wade would kill Aaron's parents, while Wade would dispense of Matthew and Tyler because little ones talk. Johnson and Aaron would wait in the car. They made one last trip up the gravel road to the Caffey's rural cabin before their gruesome plot was launched. Wade and Wilkinson crept into the house and recalled Terry. They burst into our bedroom and opened fire, shooting me several times. Wilkinson had discharged the first rounds into Penny from a twenty-two caliber pistol. Terry woke up to the awful sound of his wife's guttural moans. Not only did they come in shooting, he said, they also came in with a samurai sword. He instinctively threw his right arm over Penny's body, taking three bullets in the forearm and three in the shoulder. The seventh round ripped through his right cheek and then his ear. He explained, After they shot Penny, they shot me three more times in the back and once in the back of the leg. All in all, I think I had been shot eleven times. I could not feel the right side of my body, and nothing would come out of my mouth. I felt I had been shot in the face, and then one of them took the sword and stabbed Penny in the neck, nearly decapitating her. The impact of the bullets spun Terry onto his stomach. Charlie continued firing until his gun jammed. He gave the gun to Wade, who fixed it and fired two more shots. They left the room briefly. Then Charlie came back and cut Penny's throat with a samurai sword to make sure she was dead. Terry was shot three more times in the back. All this commotion woke the Caffey's sons. They confronted Charlie who told them to go back to bed, and they dutifully obeyed, at first. Soon enough, Matthew, the older boy, realized what was happening and fought back, kicking Charlie and demanding to know why he was in their house and harming his parents. Wade raised the twenty-two and shot Matthew in the face and then stabbed Tyler. I began to panic, Terry recalled. I was trying to get up, and I heard Matthew begin to cry out. He said, No, Charlie. When I heard his name mentioned by Matthew, I knew who was in my home and why he was there. And then I heard the gunfire. I tried to get up again, but the blood rushed to my head and I collapsed. I was later told Matthew was shot, whereas they took turns stabbing Tyler, who was hiding in a closet. Their bloodlust sated, the killers then set bedspreads, laundry, and furniture ablaze to try and destroy the evidence of their heinous crimes before making their escape. Terry was roused from the smell of the smoke. When I woke up, the house was on fire, Terry said later. I knew I wasn't able to get upstairs because the flames were just pushing me back into the bedroom, so I crawled on the bed and found Penny. She was already gone. 
Despite a severed nerve in his right arm and five gunshot wounds to his head, shoulders, and chest, he summoned the strength to get out, having to leave behind the body of his wife of nineteen years. He stumbled to the bathroom, gasping for oxygen. He said, I finally managed to crawl out our bathroom window and drag myself away from the house. The killers climbed into Charlie's vehicle. Holy shit, that was awesome! Aaron cried back in the car. Flames leapt to the sky as the murderers skidded away. Meanwhile, her father spent two agonizing hours crawling to Tommy Gaston's house, just 300 yards away. A shocked Gaston discovered him on the porch shortly after 4 a.m. I need help, gasped Terry. Where are Penny and the kids, Terry? They're all dead. Charlie Wilkinson killed my family. The ambulance and firefighters arrived at 4.30 a.m. As rescue workers strapped Terry onto a stretcher, he whispered, I don't think I'm gonna make it. Across the field, his house was engulfed in flames, the remains of his family inside. Everything Terry had loved and cherished had been obliterated. A few miles away, Aaron and Charlie slept soundly in a friend's trailer after Wade dropped them off. They had sex and passed out. Around 6 a.m., a sheriff's deputy followed up on Terry's tip. He located the trailer and found Charlie fast asleep with the murder weapon next to him. There would be no wiggle room for the young Texan. While Charlie was being interrogated, police obtained a search warrant for the ramshackle home. Between piles of trash, they discovered guns and ammunition, spent shell casings, swords, and a used condom. Hidden under a pile of clothes on the floor, they found Aaron Caffey. The girl said she only remembered a fire and two men with swords taking her from her home. There wasn't much else. She said she passed out and woke up in the trailer. Could she go home now? Everyone assumed she was a victim, the miraculous survivor of a massacre. Police took her to Hopkins County Memorial Hospital for testing, and Aaron played the part of innocent bystander to perfection. She told cops that when she woke up, the house was filled with smoke and she had seen two guys with swords who ordered her onto the floor. Aaron claimed she had no idea how she arrived at the trailer. After that, it was all a blank. She darkly added, They're coming after me. The slayings shocked tiny Alba, and indeed the whole state of Texas. These were the kinds of horrors that happened in a metropolis, such as Dallas or Houston, not a tiny farming community. At a popular teen hangout, the Y'all Come Back Cafe, friends were stunned and found the rumors concerning the killer's identities difficult to believe. They partied sometimes, but they were never bad kids to me. I mean, this shocked me hearing about it because they're not like that, especially towards me, one friend said. I don't understand how they just changed in an instant. I don't understand. I think there's something that influenced them because they're not that type of people. While the town shuddered, Aaron's story was unraveling over at the Raines County Police Department. Leading the interrogation were Sheriff's Detective Alman and Texas Ranger John Vance. Already the two investigators informed Charlie that he had been identified by a survivor. He then reportedly dropped his head.